So this is the second video I'm going to be recording for this today. Uh, I recorded the first one, but after I recorded, I had some conversations with people who um, were very good at this. Um, people that you'll probably be aware of and who I, I do respect highly um, in this area. And it's sort of to run through a few of the ideas that I think that things that I had seen and things that they had seen and sort of to try and work through how this is working. And we came to the realization, I think that there are so many holes and foibles and trip ups and issues with the way this has been drafted that people who are applying for this visa or have other visas or sort of thing need to be very cautious with their applications. So um, I'm not saying this to try and get your work because I will be flat out busy, but I've got to encourage for a lot of you to be very cautious of making this application on your own unless you are 100% certain you're okay. Um, I'm not saying definitely go and see an advisor or a lawyer, but be cautious about the application if there's anything that's um, not completely straightforward for you. There is a lot of issues here. We're going to cover a few of them today. Um, I'm not going to cover them in great detail because it'll be a very long video. I'm going to mention some anomalies we see, but I'm not going to sort of detail the anomalies too much. Um, we'll do a second video later on about the anomalies, but I will mention some of the issues that we're seeing here. Um, we've only had this these rules for actually about a day now. Um, and I've been looking through them. There's about 30 odd pages of, of uh, instructions that came through. So we'll hopefully be able to provide you with some more clarity as to what's in these, but definitely massive caution in making this application on your own or if you use a, a lawyer or an advisor, make sure that they, they know what they're looking at. Um, there are some good ones who are in the community you might see on the various Facebook groups and that, um, who will probably have a good understanding of this. Some of the other ones definitely won't. We've already seen um, people who are going already sort of putting out prices a few a month ago on what they're going to charge to do this visa with having no idea what the visa is going to be about, how it's going to work. You know, it's, it raises frustration for me. Um, when they're sort of raging here without actually knowing, without actually seeing these rules yet. Um, but that's just one of my little things I'm going to rant about. Now, we were skeptical actually about these rules coming through before the end of the month. We knew it was, they said to us before the end of October, we'll have something and we're getting close to the end of the month and we're sort of going, okay, is it going to come through in time? Um, and what we call, as lawyers call it, a Friday special, that letter that comes in just at the end of the day on Friday afternoon. Uh, this is what we got from Immigration New Zealand. We got the set of rules as to how this is going to work. It answers a number of questions uh, that many of you have raised and it raises a number of more questions and a number of issues that we're going to be talking a lot about in the future. And we're going to have a lot of uh, probably the differences of agreement with immigration on. Okay, it is 5.30 p.m. It is Saturday, 5th of October, 2021. My name is Aaron Hunter, a partner at the law firm Stace Hammond, and I head of the immigration team there. Uh, as always, this is not legal advice. This is merely our commentary on immigration in New Zealand. If you're looking for legal advice um, and for this visa, I think you definitely want to get some. Um, in contact with us, and our team will be in contact with you. Now, as you can imagine, we are getting a lot of applications, or a lot of inquiries about this. I, my phone's beeping constantly, I'm getting emails. Um, we will try to respond when we can. We have to prioritize our current paying clients first, of course, they, that's what our job is. Um, but we'll try and get to your inquiries as soon as we can. Um, and yeah, become paying clients, I suppose, um, to get that faster service. Um, as always, please like this video, subscribe, and definitely share this video for up with others. We will try to reply to any um, comments that you do make. We do try to do that, um, but it does take a lot of our time in doing those uh, replying to comments. Um, but we're going to sort of cut out what we can help you guys out. Um, but definitely, yeah, like, subscribe, sh definitely share this video with others. Um, hopefully they can help, um, help them out as well. We'll be looking at the amendment circular 2021 uh, 48 changes. Now, these will appear um, eventually on the Immigration New Zealand website. The uh, amendment circular I see has been sort of released to the, the larger public. Um, we received that yesterday evening. Now, when you hear me refer to a letter, then a number, I'm referring to the operational manual, which is the Immigration New Zealand rule book. The operational manual is where you should always go to for answers. Uh, don't go to a re regular ONZ website and see what you know, the page says here. Simply, that only holds part of the story. Go to the operational manual. That's where the actual instructions and the rules and that all is. 
Um, okay, we're not going to focus too much on the basics, as you've already will have heard about that. We will do a quick recap as we go through. Um, there are, of course, two broad ways to get this new residence visa. There is those who enter New Zealand under a CPVV uh, with, a, where, with a right to work for you know, more than six months. And there are those who are in New Zealand on 29 September 2021 uh, who held an eligible visa and met one of the three criteria. We're going to start with a general way for those who are on shore that covers most people. We, we're going to start with CPV first, um, but there's a number of anomaly, anomalies there, so we'll sort of handle those later. Um, so the first thing is having an eligible visa when the application is made. Um, so it's on 29th September 2021, uh, uh, S6101, of course that's the section, the new S6 is the, the S6 visa we're calling it. Um, has a list of eligible visas being uh, the essential skills, work instruction, work to residence, post-study work instruction, migrant exploitation protection work visa, skilled migrant category job search instructions, religious worker instructions, special work visa for victims of people trafficking, special work visas for victims of families violence, and silver firm practical experience. Most of you will be under the essential skills, work to residence, uh, or post-study work, but there are the other ones in there as well. Now, work visas under Section 61 do count as long as the applicant held one of those eligible visas prior to that, and it was held within six months of being granted the Section 61 work visa. Uh, this is a normally number one. We'll talk about that later. There's a little issue there. Um, so we're going to do a video after this in the next few days covering these anomalies in more detail. Uh, they require more thought and work on our side. But we're going to see if you said the word anomaly. I'm referring to the word that was used by... Um, people in Parliament and the, the media around um, oversights and immigration policy in the last sort of year and a half. So we're going to cover this in more detail. I've mentioned there's an anomaly there and there's an issue there, but we'll sort of cover it more later. Um, okay, so you need one of those visas that we just listed. Um, when you apply for the S6 residence visa, uh, you, you need to have had that visa on the 20th of September 2021. Now, if you have an application in place on that date, that uh, the day before they announce this visa, um, for one of those visas, then you are okay as well, as long as that visa is subsequently granted. So if you had a uh, post-study work visa application that had been made prior to that 29th of September 2021, that day, um, and it's later on granted, then they will consider you having that visa on that day. Now that includes those of you who are on an interim visa on that day, that's fine, as long as you have that application prior made to that and granted afterwards. Uh, and of course, you must be in New Zealand on that day, 29 September 2021, for this main tranche of the, the applications. Uh, the one exception there is those of you who were in Australia, who departed New Zealand for Australia between 6th of April 2021 and 23 July 2021, which is when the bubble burst. Um, but And of course, you got stuck there in Australia. Um, if you're in Australia still on the 29th of September, you're still there then, then that's okay. You can be included in um, that instruction. Now, this list is missing out on several visas, such as student visa holders and punch visa holders. This is an issue we've noted before. Uh, that's definitely anomaly number two. We'll cover that in the next video. Um, now, there has been a number of questions about people changing between the visas or getting a variation of conditions to their eligible visa. This is fine. Immigration New Zealand have stated that you can change between visas as long as you remain eligible on both visas. So you're eligible on the 20th of September on a certain visa, so you're a post-study work visa, and then it's going to look to expiring soon, so you apply for essential skills work visa, um, and you're on that visa when you apply for this uh, S6 residence visa, then that is okay because you have remained eligible throughout and at both of those two points. Um, same with if you get a variation of conditions to your essential skills work visa change employer, that's okay as well as long as you um, you are eligible at both points. You can also change actually the criteria that you apply under between those two points. So maybe you might, might be eligible perhaps under the, uh, we'll come to the criteria in a second, under scarce and you move to um, skilled, um, variation of conditions, different job. That will be a case well according to Immigration New Zealand. Now, that's actually not mentioned in the instructions. That was what we heard from them directly. Um, okay, so once if you have the eligibility of the visa, then you can go uh, look at the three S criteria. So you have settled, skilled, and scarce. You only require one of these, not all three. 
So settled is the one that most of you will fall under. They're about 70% of applicants will fall under that settled category. Uh, this is for those of you who have been in New Zealand for at least three years. Now a lot of questions about, um, and we knew there would be around this 821 days that is the requirement. 821 days between 29 September 2018 and 29 September 2021, which is, which is basically three quarters of that three year period. The question that people had was, do you need to be in New Zealand on that 29 September 2018? Or could you have arrived earlier and not been here or arrived later? Now, S16, uh, sorry, S615-1 requires the person to have first arrived in New Zealand on or before 29 September 2018 and have been in New Zealand for at least 821 days in that three-year period. So for those of you who arrived after that date for the first time, unfortunately, you weren't included in that settled criteria. For those of you who may have visited New Zealand years ago at any point prior to that, even if it's just for a holiday, but you've done the 821 days since then in that three-year period, you do trigger that settled requirement because you were in New Zealand on or before that date. Um, now, INZ have access to your travel records, so for many of you, this is the simplest pathway to residence. Now, on that basis, we'll be offering different prices uh, to assist people depending on which pathway they're taking, because this would definitely be the simplest process for us to handle uh, for you. Um, so looking at what they're going to be in the next few days, we'll sort of have an idea about that. Uh, the number of anomalies and issues that are popping up, we're still sort of working out how that's going to work. Okay, next to these uh, scarcity levels is skilled. Now, under uh, S615.5, this is those who on the 20th of September 2021, so the day before this was announced, were earning $27 per hour. Now, there are a few points here to clarify. An application for a job that for a job that paid that amount um, when you were still waiting for the work visa or the variation of conditions or even a request of a, a reconsideration for that application, uh, where that visa is subsequently granted, then this condition will be met. So even if you weren't working in that job yet, but you had an application for a visa for that job, um, then they can say that yes, once that visa is granted, you were working uh, or you meet that requirement for $27 on that day. Um, now, no matter what, the employment must be full time and at least 30 hours a week. There is some strange wording there around on average 30 hours. It's it's a strange wording of how they've, they've worded this. So this is another one of those sort of uh, anomalies, foibles that they've put in there. They've worded things really bizarrely. So again, be very cautious there, especially those of you who are working in roles where you are on a casual contract. Uh, you probably shouldn't be because it should be a permanent contract. But if you are, that's going to be an issue there. And again, seek advice if that is going to be you. Um, now, for those who have had a reduction in pay or hours due to COVID-19, especially those who are in lockdown, S615-5F covers you. Uh, the disruption needs to arise directly from the government order for the lockdown taking place, which would then require your employer to have to restrict its activity so you can't work or work less hours. Um, you, need to be able to, you need to show that you are work, you're earning more um, earn that $27 per hour prior to lockdown starting or the disruption starting, so you can't have... Um, had a pay increase while you were in uh, that lockdown, that lower lowered status, um, and you need to, need to return back to that twenty-seven dollars an hour or more after the disruption has come to an end, so lockdown ends effectively. Now they do require um, evidence of um, an agreement to have that reduced um, reduced hours or pay rate. Um, now that's in writing is what they say, that even it's in writing, so that could cover text messages or emails that covers that, so make sure you save those or find those if you've got them somewhere, save them somewhere. Um, if it was done verbally, that could be more difficult. If your employer sit you down and had a chat and you've agreed that uh, you'll take lo lower pay because that's all they can afford to pay you, then you may have an issue there because you cannot show um, that that agreement was, was made in writing because it wasn't. Um, and again, yeah, if you, you can't have a, a pay increase while you're in lockdown earning a lesser amount. So uh, if you're in lockdown, you're being paid less, your employer can't say, hey, actually, we're going to give you a pay rise. Once we're out, not going to matter. You must be showing payment of that amount prior to that lockdown taking place. Um, now, for those of you working roles that require you to sleep overnight at the location, uh, which you often are paid less than the $27 per hour, typically minimum wage, um, INZ won't include those overnight night sleep hours when calculating your hourly wage. But typically, if you are in that sort of position, you're working in sort of the healthcare or that sort of caring role, you'll fall under the scarce category anyway. So we're not quite sure why they've entered uh, that bit of the, the, the rules within the, uh, the um, skilled category of the, 
the allowances, but that's what they've done. Uh, now, approving your pay. Um, if you've previously provided an employment agreement with an early application which shows the, the pay as being $20 an hour or more, immigration is, the immigration officer can consider that and see that as being proof of that you're earning that amount. If your pay has increased since then, uh, then under S6551, you'll need to provide evidence to show the increase occurred before or on 29 September 2021. Now, there is a way they've worded this, which is really confusing, and it could be, um, it's not clear um, whether it comes down to whether they have, whether you have had the increase prior to that date, or you agreed to the increase prior to that date, or that the increase was, was post-date or pre, no. It's, Again, it's one of those things that has been badly drafted or unclearly drafted. It's one of those anomalies, which again, get advice on this if that's going to be you, which is you know, a number of you. Um, now, the evidence must include, and the word must is important here, because must basically means they have to get this, an employment agreement or a letter from the employer stating the pay in hours. Um, now, the word, the word letter there is unusual. Usually it's not in writing, but letter, we can't expect that they mean a bit of paper. Uh, because nowadays it's unusual, typically you'd get an email or, you know, um, but they want something in writing, an employment agreement that's been updated with the new rate or a letter or, yeah. Um, and one of the following, uh, a full bank statement showing the salary payment, a summary of earnings from IRD showing the tax being paid and what's being earned, and all pay slips. Um, again, issue there with the word must and with the word the, with letter. Um, letters is a strange thing for them to use. Um, again, be cautious there, get advice. Uh, and finally, we have scarce. Now, this is where you have a job on one of the four lists which, which INZ have provided. Now, there's the long-term skill shortage list, um, jobs requiring occupational registration in health or education sector, primary carers and other critical health workers, and the primary sector roles. Now, the idea here is that you are in a job that INZ states there is a shortage or a real need for, is sort of our assumption as to why they've chosen these 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 these, um, these lists primary sector roles it's arguable whether there is a shortage there or not um, it's, it's an unusual one now the evidence is easy if you already hold a visa that lists your employment and that employment is on one of those lists already being determined that that is your role and that's the employment you've got and that's what you do if that's the case the employment, uh, immigration officer um, should be satisfied the criteria is met hopefully uh, if your occupation has changed, then you'll need to provide evidence that this change occurred before 29 September 2021, and would question as to why you haven't applied for a variation of conditions anyway. Um, now, if you are on a post study work visa, then your job won't have previously been assessed. You need to provide an employment agreement or a letter from your employer stating your occupation and hours. This is again one of those strange things where a letter might be enough without the employment agreement. It is worth to see how immigration handle this. Uh, the, the immigration officer can ask for more evidence, but if your, your employer has provided a letter to confirm that it's your occupation and it appears on one of those lists, then you have sort of fulfilled that requirement. So it's, it's a strange one. Now, the, of, the officer, um, of course, it will need to be full time, at least 30 hours per week. Again, there's issues with the wording there. Um, and you look at whether you're being paid fairly for that job, we assume. There seems to be a lot of things missing here. Uh, and this is one of the anomalies we're getting here in that typically you have the requirement to meet the ANSCO requirements for a role that, you know, you work in a role and ANSCO requires you to have you know, X, this qualification or Y experience. Um, that seems to be missing here, that sort of need to show that you sort of fit that role. Um, the other issue here is that now, typically, okay, here's an example, okay, with ANSCO, with a, um, we'll go with a software engineer. So a software engineer under ANSCO requires a bachelor's level degree uh, or five years experience to replace the bachelor's um, degree, five years experience as a software engineer. Now, the LTSSL, the long-term skill shortage list, um, requires that um, you have a bachelor's degree followed by three years of experience after you've done the bachelor's degree. So it's a higher threshold to meet. Now, typically that's the requirement to go for uh, an LTSSL visa, which uh, incidentally, the LTSSL work visas finish tomorrow, tomorrow's the last day. If you want those visas, um, tomorrow's the last day to apply for that afterwards, they are gone. Um, but here there's no requirement to prove you meet the LTSSL requirements or that you meet the ANSCO requirements. It basically is just that your employer says that's what they do. Uh, and we can ask for more evidence, but there's no apparent requirement for that. 
it's it's unusual again um get advice um Weirdly, we also see there's a done up, done up of some roles. So some of roles appear in more than one list. Um, there's also some roles which seem to be absent, where other roles are there, which we've sort of confused as to why they are there. Another anomaly sort of there. We'll look at that in more depth in a later video. Um, but that is basically the three S categories, the, the settled, the skilled, the scarce. Uh, and those are for those who are in the country 29th of September 2021 or who are in Australia because they got stuck there. Um, and that will cover the vast majority of you applying for this new visa. That leaves us those who are coming in under the CPVV, the Critical Purpose Visitor Visa. Um, now, S610.5 states that people meet the requirements for holders of CPVV. And there's a list of things there I'm not going to sort of explain to you. But the idea is that you have come into the country um, as a other critical worker with a, um, a work visa that allows you for more than six months of work. Or a critical health visa, a critical health worker with more than six months uh, allowed on your visa, or you already held a visa and, and, one, and a role that was deemed one of those two things, and you got a variation to maybe re-enter the country. Um, there is an exclusion for those who come in who get granted a border exception for deep water fishing crew, agricultural, horticultural, mobile plant operators, shearers, and RSC seasonal employees. You are not eligible to apply under these allowances despite you getting a CPVB, which would otherwise be um, fall within this. So the immigration officer needs to look at your application and go, okay, you had a CPVB, did you meet that six months or more? And was it for health, critical health care? Was it for other critical worker? Um, the only allowance there is that if it's for less than six months, if perhaps your visa was your passport was due to expire, so they give you a lesser amount, then they can sort of take that into consideration. Uh, there is some flexibility there, but they're basically looking for those two categories: the critical health worker, the other critical worker, comes to the country for more than with an allowance of work for more than six months. That's what they're looking for. Uh, nurses coming in to do CAP, you will be eligible should you complete your CAP training and gain registration and then apply for this visa before 31st of July 2022. Uh, you can be eligible then for this uh, visa. Um, and those of you who perhaps entered the country on a CPVV uh, and have since, since moved to another eligible visa, say an essential skills work visa, they will, um, you'll still fall under this section um, rather than under skilled or, or scarce. Now, there are some other requirements. This is where some of the larger sort of issues arise. And I'm going to begin, <laughs> once again, um, you might want to talk to her and get advice on these things. There are, of course, other requirements, most notably character and health requirements, and there's some strange allowances here. So first thing we'll get out of the way, police certificates. Uh, applicants not required to apply police certificates from their country of citizenship or countries where they've spent more than 12 months in the past 10 years. Now, previously with um, your other work, your work visas, you've be, been asked for um, country of citizenship and anywhere you've lived for more than five years since the age of 17. Now that changes with residence to um, citizenship and places you've had more than 12 months in in the past 10 years, even if it's you know, lots of short visits in that country, uh, you require that. Now here they're not requiring that. Now that is a large change. It means that uh, they're not going to be checking to see whether you have a uh, criminal histories or issues in those countries. Um, when they may not have previously had a um, certificate from that country because it wasn't in the five years since 17 triggers, but it is under the 12 month and 10 year one, um, but there is no requirement there. Now, there is no word if we can still see as many checks being sent off with third parties through the, um, the NSC or these you know, additional checks they're doing. We'd hate to see uh, immigration replacing police certificates with these external checks, which they take much longer to process. Um, but that's worth the wait and see. Now, limited medicals. Medicals uh, is going to be one of the bigger issues we have with this visa and how it's going to apply. Now, first thing, limited medicals um, are required for all applicants unless the medical was provided in the previous three years. Now, there is some confusion about what a limited medical is. Now, if you have general medicals and limited medicals. Now, general medicals are what usually is required for the main applicant for residents, uh, with dependents and partners going through with limited medicals being uh, a simpler easier test to get done. Here everyone gives a limited medical unless they've given one previously three years. Now it does appear that some medical places, some, some physicians aren't sure what a limited medical is versus a general medical and I've had a few people tell me that they've gone to a, and they've been told well what's a limited medical. Um, if you get a general medical that should be okay. It's not, you know, the, the general medical covers limited medical. They're not going to say no that's the wrong medical type because it is a more um, 
a more well-rounded covering everything sort of medical than the limited one is. Um, but the limited medical should hopefully be easier and cheaper to get uh, if your panel physician can provide it. Now we're also aware that there are places in Auckland who are still doing medicals in level three. So if you are looking for, to get one for this or for any other visa, call around, they are some open and doing them, but a number of them are closed. Um, the other big issue with the medicals is there is a change to A460, and this could be the, the most fundamental change in this entire residence visa and, and what they've chosen to do. I haven't actually written a script on this because this has been being worked on in my head and I've been speaking with my, my colleagues about this. Now, A460H is the new one they're bringing in, and typically if you have gone for a medical and you've had um, a health condition, um, you've which they have deemed to be significant enough that it's going to cost a lot to the country, um, they can um, decline you ASH, or acetyl standard of health, that's what we call that ASH, uh, and you have to then apply for a medical waiver and ask them to basically let you into the country anyway, or grant you the visa anyway, despite you not meeting this criteria, um, or the run the risk of costing the country um, significant money. It's only about you know, $40,000, uh, $41,000 is basically the limit. It costs more than forty grand in medical health here going forward, uh, you're, you're going to get a no. However, there's been a change here in that the medical waivers um, for this visa, so if you've gone for your test and they've found there's an issue with you, um, the medical waiver can only be denied if it is TB, if it is a severe hemophilia. I'm sorry to bring up the, um, the rules here again so I get the exact wording. Um, so A640H, so if you require dialysis um, or are likely to require it in the next five years, uh, severe hemophilia, physical, intellectual, cognitive and or sensory incapacity that requires full-time care, including care in the community, uh, and then tuberculosis, and there's several ones of tuberculosis, there are history of tuberculosis or things, uh, MDR, TB, XDR, TB. Um, if you have those things, then they can deny you uh, a medical waiver. Now, H says, the new one they brought in, applicants for residence class visas under this category, they give the full name, who otherwise meet the criteria for residence under those instructions will be granted a medical waiver unless A applies. And A is just that small section of dialysis, hemophilia, the um, full-time care requirement, and TB. That's it. Um, it there's no mention there of cancer, no mention there of Hep B, Hep C, AIDS, um, MS, um, heart issues. There's so many other issues here, so many other ones which typically would be, you know, chronic respiratory disease, significant or disabling hereditary uh, disorders. Um, there's so many things here which typically would be on the list of no chance that you're coming in here to, nope, that's fine. In you come, which again, this is a, a massive um, change to the rules here, and I, I just can't see that that was the intention. If that's the intention, that's just crazy. Um, it's great for those who come into the country who want to bring in uh, a uh, or, or you know, get reasons for a child who may have Down syndrome, but not to a uh, not no, not the, the more severe level, the, the lower level that doesn't require full time care. Uh, or they know that they're, they're not having themselves to some degree, or those with uh, autism, but again, um, who are who are not on the uh, who are on the the spectrum, but not at the the higher end. Um, but it also includes um, people with, uh, I suppose, Alzheimer's if they still don't need um, full care, um, cerebral palsy if they don't need care. It comes down to there with. It would come down to how much care they require. But if you've got Hep B, Hep C, um, you've got cancer, you could fall in and, and still be allowed to come to this country as residents. And then you have that health care cost covered, which is just incredible. So we we'll have to see as to how this is interpreted. Uh, and we expect this is going to get a lot of uh, coverage in the media and in Parliament. But that is going to be a, a massive one. So. That's probably, right now, that's the, the most surprising part of the, this, this rule for us. And again, I think if, if, you, if you have any possible health conditions, what's with all your family do, uh, get advice. Get advice with this application. Get an expert involved. Um, okay, 
back to my script. Um, there is two phases, of course, to this application. The first is a smaller one, 1 December 2021. It's open to those who had an SFC application in process, uh, those who had a uh, Register from Work application in process, or those who had an EOI in the pool for SMC, who had dependents included in the application when they submitted, um, who were 78 years of age and older, as at 29 September 2021. Everyone else is in phase two on 1 March 2022. Now, if you apply before 1 March 2022 and you're not, el not eligible for that phase one, your application will be declined. They will not defer it. You cannot jump the queue and try to get there and they get there early. Uh, you're wasting your time. Now, while you have uh, the SMC, RFW, or the EOI, it doesn't mean you'll be eligible for this visa. Most likely you will, but definitely go through and check to make sure you are wasting your time otherwise. Um, those of you who have an RFW in the higher paying role who are looking to go straight to permanent residence, you may want to look at the timing and see whether it's worth staying on that or going to this new visa. These old visas will keep getting processed. They are not going to stop them being processed. Uh, there's definitely a delay right now with the, the lockdown. It's affecting the, uh, the processing because the, you know, the paper base and the offices are closed. Um, but yeah, look at the, the advantages there. If you're looking at staying in New Zealand, then it might be easier to get the residency earlier through this new visa. Uh, again, you know, move to citizenship earlier because of this new visa. If you're looking at possibly leaving the country um, sooner and want the PR quicker, stay with the old one. There's a lot of things to, just, to just decide there. Again, definitely get um, advice on that and help, and they can help you work through the timings. Um, Okay, now if you do apply in phase one, INZ should move your application fee across from your current application to the new application and stop processing the previous application. Um, INZ will know that you have both applications and the other one will stop being processed. And when the new visa is granted, the old one should basically just sort of be dropped and, and nullified and ended because you've got residence. So the cost, of course, is 2160 including GST. This is about what we thought it was going to be. Uh, we were thinking about 2200, 2300. So we're pretty close to what, what, um, what it came through as. Uh, if you have paid in advance for a SMC application, then on applying for this, they should transfer the cost across and refund you the difference. If you've paid for a residence from work, which is slightly cheaper, they will ask you to pay the difference. Now, that's what they've told us in our, um, our discussions with them or with, in the webinars that they've done. Uh, not much clarity in this on that point, um, but that is how they have said they are going to, to handle that. Um, okay, now... The other thing to note is uh, parents and dependent children and the anomalies that come with them. There's a number of anomalies with this. Partners and children can be included. Partners must be able to show 12 months living together. If you don't show 12 months living together, then you may be able to defer the application. There is some allowances in the other operational rules to do that. Um, question is whether you can in this one it's not clear within the rules here again you know, get advice um you'll need evidence of living together um check our video on living together we sort of explain what living together evidence is um generally we'll be looking i think for most of our clients to get them to include their partner and their dependents definitely their dependents but their partner um and immigration can always say that no, actually no you're not going to meet you can remove them but on our first reading, we're thinking that the applicants uh, should be included and possibly deferred if that's the case, but we'll wait and see what um, how things progress. Dependents are simpler. If they are your child and 17 years or younger and single, they are your dependent. If they're 18 to 20 with no children of their own and single, they are dependents. If they are 21 to 24 with no children, are single and totally or substantially reliant on an adult, whether that is you or somebody else for financial support, uh, whether they live with you or not, they are dependent. So those kids that are off studying somewhere else can still be dependent up to the age of 24. Now, here we have a first. And this is the allowance for dependents who are 25 years and older um, because of those who are applications who may have made a couple of years ago when they were 24 and they've now sort of gotten older and hasn't been granted yet under SMC or RFW or the EOIs. Now, under S1610, a dependent child who is 25 year, years old or older can be eligible if, on 29 September 2021, they were included in an EOI for SMC, or they were included in an application for SMC or an application for residence from work. They meet the requirements for classification as a dependent child, 
when the EOI or the application for residency was submitted previously, uh, and they continue to meet the requirements um, to be a dependent child apart from their age. So they must still be dependent, must still be single, must still be childless. Um, and one of their parents must be being approved for this new visa. Now that's the important point there is that these applications must be made after the parent has been granted um, their work visa. There is a requirement under the uh, immigration uh, regulations that a dependent child cannot be 25 years older and included within the application. So that's, there's a need here to uh, allow them to apply on their own once their parent has been granted their visa. So the parent can apply for the visa 1st of December and once that visa is granted, the dependent child can then apply um, up to 31st of July 2022. So those applications from 1st of December have to be done by then to include the child. Um, and but that of course that child must also apply uh, must also pay their own application fee. So it's twenty one sixty for the whole family except for any other dependent children, being that uh, older child who's twenty one sixty on their own. Now partners and dependent children who offshore can be offshore can be included, which is great. We're going to spend more time working on the intricacies of the uh, border entry allowances around residence visas because it's always a it's a tricky one um, but there should be hopefully an allowance here uh, for people to enter the country we're looking into that um, in more detail um, and that is actually it for today I think this has been a, a long enough video we do have a video to do on anomalies uh, to go into more depth with some of these issues that we're sort of looking at uh, we'll do that in the next couple of days um, I want to try and get this video out and um, actually get some other work done. We are doing a live Q&A on uh, Stage 7 Facebook page on Monday at 7pm. There's a link to it in the description down below. Uh, come along to that. We'll try and answer some questions there. Um, and we'll also be emailing those who have been in contact with us, asking us to assist them with this 2021 residence visa applications. We only help a certain number of you. So if you do want us to help you, uh, get in contact with us. Um, and we will be running out of capacity at some point. We want to make sure that we don't overload ourselves uh, so that our clients do get uh, the proper service that they deserve. Um, I'll be going through and responding to as many inquiries as possible in the next couple of days. We've had a massive backlog and more applications and messages in the last few days. You've a few phone calls while doing this video. Uh, just a few of the cuts you've seen in the video. Um, and we'll be going through those next few days as well. Um, and we're making changes to the website so that pretty soon you'll be able to actually book a meeting or a video call with me uh, to go through a few things without having to actually talk to me in advance. You can just go on the website and book that. That is coming shortly. Uh, and that is it for today. We'll be back with a video on anomalies uh, in the next few days. And of course, our Q&A session on Monday. Until then, kia kaha and stay safe.